Hello, thanks for joining us as we continue our journey through Mark's Gospel. Jesus enters Jerusalem. It's quite the show. The crowds flock to see, but what does it all mean? The section we're looking at is Mark chapter 10 and verse 46 through to Mark chapter 11 and verse 11. As well as watching this video or listening to the podcast, I'd recommend you read the passage for yourself. To help, I put a link to an online Bible in the video description. Last summer, my wife and I decided to watch The Crown on Netflix. It was an interesting program and entertaining, although we did have to fact check a number of the storylines. Near the beginning, there's an episode that deals with the plans for Queen Elizabeth's coronation. Looking back, it was a monumental occasion. Still in the early days of television, 27 million tuned in from all over the UK and millions more from across the world. It was a day to remember, a day of celebration. Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem has the feel of a coronation. That's certainly Mark's message. Here is the king coming to claim his kingdom. The journey begins 15 miles away with Jesus in Jericho. He's on his way out of the city with his disciples and surrounded by a huge crowd. Over the commotion, a voice penetrates through the noise. It belongs to a blind beggar called Bartimaeus. In verse 47, Mark tells us, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Hearing that Jesus was passing by, Bartimaeus cries out for help. Jesus shocks the crowd by stopping and asking them to bring Bartimaeus to him. And then in verse 51, he asks him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man states the obvious. He wants to see. So Jesus heals him. It's another tremendous miracle to add to the list. Yet if that's all we see here, we're missing something important. When Bartimaeus calls out to Jesus, he uses a very particular phrase. He calls him the son of David. Now, David is someone we read about in the Old Testament. He was a shepherd boy from the town of Bethlehem. With God's help, he defeated a giant of a man called Goliath, who was threatening and fighting against the Israelites. Later, he became the king of Israel and reigned for about 40 years. One day, God promised David that his line would be the kingly line, and that one day one of his descendants would sit on the throne of God's kingdom forever. As the blind man calls out to Jesus, he is making a connection between the man in front of him and this promise God made to David in the Old Testament. Jesus is royalty. He's the son of David. Are these just the crazy ramblings of a blind beggar? Or are they something more? The very first verse of Mark's gospel tells us that Jesus is the Messiah. That means he's God's promised king. Bartimaeus may be physically blind, but according to Mark, he is seeing something incredible about Jesus. As they get near Jerusalem, Jesus sends two of his disciples into a village to get a donkey. Now this donkey takes up quite a bit of space in the passage, so there's something significant going on here. But what is it? In Matthew's Gospel, we're reminded of a prophecy in the Old Testament where God had promised that his king would come riding on a donkey. In commandeering the donkey and riding it into Jerusalem, Jesus is making a clear claim to be the king. But let's look a bit closer. Mark tells us that this donkey has never been ridden before. Now, I'm no expert in riding donkeys. I think I rode one once at Scarborough Beach, but that's about it. Yet even I know you don't want to ride an animal that hasn't been ridden before. They won't like it. They're likely to buck and try to throw you off. But what happens when Jesus sits on the donkey? The amazing answer is nothing. In chapter 11 and verse 7 we read, When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. That's it. It's as if even the donkey recognises something different about Jesus. That the king is now sitting on his back. That's certainly a sentiment that the crowd embrace. In verse 8, we read about what happened as Jesus rode towards Jerusalem. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. In a moment, the dirt road was covered with coats and palm leaves a soft carpet for the donkey and its rider. But that wasn't all. The crowd then begin to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. 
Hosanna in the highest heaven. There's praise. There's joy. Much like the crowds who pack the streets to see their local football team parading the trophies that they've just won. But I want you to particularly notice that the crowd make a connection between Jesus and David. Here, the crowd are recognising Jesus as God's coming king. Yes, the same city rejected him just a few days later and we'll consider some of the reasons for that. But for now, let's focus on Mark's point. Jesus is God's promised king. Okay, now that's all very interesting, but what does it mean to you and me today? If we want to answer that, we need to take a step back and look at the big picture of the Bible. The Bible begins with God making everything, and it's all absolutely perfect. There is no death, there is no pain, and people live in a perfect relationship with each other, and more importantly, with God. So what went wrong? Sin went wrong. The first people, Adam and Eve, disobeyed God. The result, everything got messed up. Because of sin, our relationship with God was ruined. Our relationships with each other became fraught with difficulties and the whole creation began to groan. Yet at that point, God did something else. He promised someone who would fix it. God repeats that promise throughout the Old Testament, becoming more and more specific as time goes by. It's this promise that God is talking about when he promises that one day a king will come. You see, the Bible's claim is that Jesus is the one who will repair our relationship with God. He's the one that can deal with the problem of our sin and disobedience. Do you want to know God? Do you want to be right with God, having your sins forgiven? Jesus is the one who can do it. That's Mark's claim in his gospel and the message the Bible gives over and over again. That's all for today. The events we've just looked at took place on the Sunday of Jesus' final week, the week that led up to his death on the cross. We'll continue that journey next time. If you want to be notified when the next episode comes out, do like or subscribe on our Facebook page or YouTube channel or on Apple or Spotify podcasts. Hopefully, see you then.